Hello everyone, welcome to Biotechnica. So this time I will be discussing about gibberellic acid phytohormone which is also called as gibberellin. This is one of the most important phytohormone where you have to focus on certain points like discovery, what are bioactive and inactive gibberellin acid, what are the biological functions, what is the signaling pathway that is involved, what is the biosynthesis and related inhibitors. So let's understand all these points one by one in details. So firstly talking about the introduction of gibberellic acid. So these are known as the largest class of phytohormone. So that are tetracyclic in its structure. Tetracyclic means they contain four cyclic rings in their structure and they are diterpenoid acids. Means they are acidic compound that contains 20 carbon in their structure. And they belongs to the classes of terpenes that is a secondary metabolite and hence they are called as diterpenoid acid. This gibberellic acid is a dihydroxylated gibberellin. Means when all four rings are arranged, they are hydroxylated at two carbon and two hydroxyl groups are added to the structure. That's why it is also called as dihydroxylated gibberellin. So we have seen this is a tetracyclic compound, diterpenoid acid as well as dihydroxylated gibberellin that makes GA an active gibberellic acid. Now let's come to the discovery of this phytohormone. So for the first time, it was discovered in a rice plant that was infected with the fungus Fusarium fusicori. And it was observed that the fungus that was infecting the rice plant, the plant was abnormally tall. And after some time, it was lodging and the reduced yield was observed. And hence the name foolish seedling disease or bacane to the rice plant was given. So it was just because of the fungus Fusarium fusicori that was releasing a compound called as gibberling. So this was for the first time recognized by E. Kurosawa in 1926. What this foolish seedling disease, it was rec recognized by E. Kurosawa. But this Fusarium fusicori, after some point of time, it was renamed as Gibberla fusicori, which is releasing a compound called as gibberlin and this gibberlin is only responsible for the cause of this foolish seedling disease so this compound was isolated by yabuta and somoki in 1930 so recognition was done by e korosawa whereas isolation was done by yabuta and somoki in 1930 so the gibberlin that was isolated from the plant was ga1 that's why it is the first plant gibberling that was isolated from plants. So here you have to focus on the foolish seedling disease that is related to the gibberlin phytohormone which was recognized by E. Kurosawa and isolation was done by Yabuta and Somoki. Now let's come to the third point that is active and inactive gibberlic acid. So if you see this gibberling acid is a 20 carbon compound. But when a decarboxylation happens, one CO2 is released, which results in the formation of 19 carbon. And this 19 carbon is only known as the biologically active form of gibberellic acid. Whereas this 20 carbon is called as the inactive gibberellin. So you have to learn that 19 carbon is only the active form of GA. So what are the examples of active GA? As you can get a direct question in exam, that is GA 1, 3, 4 and 7. So 1, 3, 4 and 7, they are the active forms of gibberellic acid. Now how this gibberellic acid is actually activated? It is activated because of the presence or addition of two side groups. The one being hydroxylated and the other is carboxyl acid group. So I have mentioned in the introduction that it is a dihydroxylated gibberlin. That means two hydroxyl groups are added at carbon third as well as carbon 13. Whereas in carbon seven position, one carboxylic acid group is added and that's what it is making gibberlic acid a bioactive form of 
gibberlin. So this is all about the bioactive and inactive form where you have to focus on C19 form is the biologically active form of gibberlin whereas C20 is an inactive form. And how this activated form of gibberlin is formed? It is because of the two hydroxyl groups that are added at C13 and C3 position. There is one carboxylic acid group at carbon 7 position. Now let's come to the biosynthetic mechanism of this gibberlin. So the precursor molecule that is antiquarin that is used to initiate this biosynthetic pathway. So you have to learn this antiquarin is acting as a precursor for this phytohormone. And the pathway is taking place in plastid, ER as well as cytosol. So there are three different locations in which the biosynthetic mechanism is finally done. And the pathway name is terpenoid pathway. So this is the pathway through which gibberlin is synthesized in the endosperm of the seed. So firstly the pathway starts with the IPP that is isopentanyl pyrophosphate which diffuses from the cytosol into the plastid and from where it is coming? It is coming either from pyruvate or glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This IPP is converted to GGPP that is geranyl generin pyrophosphate which is further converted into antiquarine. Means here antiquarine is synthesized in the presence of quarine synthase enzyme. So this quarine synthase causes the conversion of GGPP into antiquarine. And finally antiquarine is synthesized which will diffuse into ER. So before it diffuses, it is converted to GA12 aldehyde because this antiquarine is oxidized and is converted to GA12 aldehyde. Now you can see this GA12 aldehyde in the ER. So this aldehydic group is then removed and results into the formation of GA12 finally. Now here happens the first hydroxylation. We have seen two hydroxyl groups are added. So here happens a first hydroxylation reaction at carbon 13. So this GA12 is now converted into GA53. Now we have two different forms of gibberlin. GA12 as well as gibberlin acid 53. Both these forms of gibberlin will diffuse into the cytosol. As you can see, both can diffuse into the cytosol and here happens a second hydroxylation reaction at carbon 3 which is known as 3-beta hydroxylation. And this hydroxylation re results into the formation of GA4 from GA12 as well as GA1 from GA53. And we all know that there are four bioactive forms of gibberlin that is 1, 3, 4, 7. And here we are seeing that two bioactive forms of gibberlins are already formed. So this is all about the activation of gibberlic acid and the synthesis of GA inside, inside the plant cell. Now let's see the signaling mechanism of the gibberlin phytohormone. So the ligand over here is gibberlin itself that is synthesized by the biosynthetic pathway. The receptor name is GID1 that stands for gibberlin insensitive dwarf 1 protein. The inhibitor here is DELA. D stands for an amino acid aspartate, E for glutamic acid, alpha leucine, again alpha leucine and A is alanine here. So here DELA is an inhibitor of gibberlic acid pathway. The transcription factor is MIB that is MYB and the pathway again is ubiquitin mediated 26S proteasomal degradation pathway. So what happens? This gibberlic acid is mainly known for the seed germination. So what happens? Once the gibberlic acid is formed, it diffuses in the seed car layer that is alluron layer. And here happens the signaling pathway. Now once gibberlic acid diffuses in the alluron layer, here starts the signaling process. So inside the nucleus, this gibberlic acid binds to the receptor that is GID1. Means the receptor for gibberlic acid, it is present inside the nucleus that is the intracellular receptor to which the signaling pathway will be activated. This will lead to the conformational changes of this receptor and activates the F-box protein component of this GID1. So this GID1 is a F-box protein which will cause the ubiquitinylation of its target that is a repressor protein. And what is the repressor here? It's a DELA. 
So it will mark this protein for 26 as proteasomal degradation pathway. So once the Della repressor is cleaved, so the transcription factor is free. Because what happens when the signaling is off? This inhibitor binds to the transcription factor that is MIB. So suppose this is Della inhibitor. It will always occupy the binding site for the transcription factor that is MIB. And now MIB is not free. That is the signaling is shut down. But when GA binds to the GID1 receptor, F-box protein is activated. And this F-box protein will cause the cleavage of this DELA inhibitor, which frees this transcription factor MYB. Now this MYB is activated, it's free. That will enter inside to the nucleus and will act as a promoter of alpha amylase gene transcription. Now through this, alpha amylase enzyme will be formed, which will leave the aileron layer and reach to the endosperm. And in endosperm, we know starch is the stored food. Because I, have, I mentioned that gibberlic acid is responsible for the G seed germination process. So how seed germination will actually be uh, happen? Because starch has to be broken down. And once the starch is broken down, all this starch will be converted into smaller granules, which will serve as a food for the developing endosperm or you can say seed. Now, once the MYB is free, it will cause the transcription of alpha amylase enzyme. And this alpha amylase will not diffuse into the endosperm from this aileron layer. And now this starch that is stored in the endosperm is broken down into smaller pieces that will actually serve as the food for the developing embryo. And here we can see seed germination in the starch endosperm. So this is about the signaling of gibberlic acid. So in the absence of gibberlic acid, this inhibitor will always occupy the binding site for the transcription factor. But when gibberlic acid is present, it will bind to its receptor that is GID1. And now the F-box component of GID1 is activated, which can cleave the repressor protein. And the repressor here is DELA. Now the repressor is ubiquitinylated and marked for 26 as proteasomal degradation and the transcription factor MIB is free. Now it will enter into the nucleus that will initiate the gene transcription for the alpha amylase enzyme. And we all know that this is an enzyme that will act on the amylose unit of starch. And now the starch will be broken down into smaller pieces in the endosperm that will serve as a food for the developing embryo. And here we can see the seed germination process in the starch endosperm. So this is all about the signaling where you have to focus on ligand. What is the receptor? What is the name of inhibitor? What is the pathway involved as well as the transcription factor. So now let's come to the biological function of gibberlic acid in plants. Firstly, it helps in the stem elongation. As we have seen in the discovery, it was causing the fullest seedling disease where the rice plant was abnormally tall. And why it was tall? Because of the stem elongation. And it is because of the GA1 gibberlic acid. Or we can also say it is helping to overcome the dwarf shoots. Suppose if the dwarf shoots are there and the stem size is not increasing. So if we supply the gibberlic acid from outside, it will help in the internodal elongation that will elongate the gap between the two nodes. So here it was seen in pea and maize. It also helps in the seed germination process because it induces the transcription of alpha amylase enzyme and causes the mobilization of food in the starchy endosperm. So it also helps in the seed germination process. So we can say it is removing the seed dormancy because it is able to regulate alpha amylase enzyme. It also helps in the bolting process. You have seen some of the ro rosette plants like cauliflower, spinach, in which there is no stem. But if you want to induce stem in these rosettes plants, this is what called as bolting. So it helps in the elongation of stem in rosette plants like beetroot, onion, spinach, etc. It also helps in the vernalization process. What is vernalization? 
plants that requires cold temperature for its flowering but if you are not providing any cold temperature and if you want to use a substitute for it you can use gibberellic acid so it is also used as a substitute in the process of vernalization it also induces parthenocarpy which is a process to induce the formation of flowers and fruits without fertilization so you can form seedlet grapes with the help of ga3 gibberellic acid also induces the formation of malproduction in barley it also helps in the formation of photomorphogenesis and induces flowering in plants and also it induces the transcription of floral meristem identity gene and this gene is causing the induction of floral organ identity gene and in turn cause the development of flowers in the plants so in turn it regulates the flowering process too now let's see what are the inhibitors involved in this gibberellic acid pathway so we have seen the biosynthetic mechanism and the biosynthesis was happening in three different organelle that is plastid second is er and third is cytosol but if you want to tar target or regulate this biosynthetic mechanism so inhibitors are available for all three organisms so let's see the inhibitors that are involved in this ga pathway so the first inhibitor is for plastid so if you want to target the plastid ka enzymes that is quarin synthase as well as quarin oxidase quarin synthase was causing the conversion of ggpp into ant quarin and if you want to target this enzyme that is ks quarin synthase you can add inhibitors like amo1618 cycocell as well as phosphon d which are used as as a reducing uh, agent to reduce the height of the stem and the second inhibitor is for er under er we have seen the conversion of ga12 aldehyde into ga12 as well as ga53 and if you want to target the enzymes for the conversion of this ga12 aldehyde into ga12 we can use paclobutrazole and in cytosol we have seen the final conversion of inactive form of gibberellin into active gibberellin and if you want to target this enzyme so as to not cause the conversion of this inactive form into bioactive we can use inhibitors like prohexadione so it will target the ga3 oxidase that were catalyzing the second hydroxylation reaction in cytosol and we can simply target this uh, gibberellic acid biosynthesis mechanism so this is all about the gibberellic acid phytohormone where we have seen the discovery bioactive and inactive form of gibberellic acid biological functions signaling pathway biosynthetic mechanism as well as the inhibitors involved so thank you everyone for watching this session if you like do not forget to like share and subscribe to the channel that is biotechnica meet you in the next session with a different phytohormone till then take care bye bye have a nice day happy learning